So um, thanks again for that introduction and for the invitation to um, to speak with you all this evening. Um, as I said, this is one of my favorite things to do uh, for my job is to just talk about the herbarium and talk about plants. And um, so this is a real treat for me. And um, tonight I'm going to share with you um, a story and information about uh, digitizing our collections at the Academy. And um, I'm also enjoying this because it's a little bit of a break from talking about my research. Um, so, so this is just a lot of fun. Um, this is a big project and we're sort of in the early stages of it right now, um, but it's really starting to rock and roll. And so um, there's a lot of sort of energy and um, excitement about it and still a little bit of, you know, like pinch me, this is actually happening. Um, and I think you'll get a sense of that as as I get sort of further on in the talk. But um, before I start diving too much into digitization and this particular project, I want to take a step back and make sure that we're all sort of on the same page about uh, what a herbarium is and what herbarium specimens are. And I'm going to start by defining a herbarium for you um, and talking about why they exist. So. A herbarium is really um, just a museum for plants. Uh, they are, our herbarium is a systematically arranged collection of dried plants, and they really serve as this sort of warehouse or storehouse of most of the scientific data that relates to plants. So um, oftentimes when I talk about herbaria with folks, um, they ask me where our living plants are, um, we have no living plants. Um, botanical gardens and conservatories are a great place um, that do store scientific knowledge about plants, um, but those are all living ones. So we are definitely in charge of the dead ones. Um, herbaria have been around for a long time. Um, the oldest still extant, so still sort of living herbarium um, was originally constructed in the 1540s, and it's still around these days. This is a herbarium in Italy. Um, nowadays, there are about 3,500 herbaria around the world from 183 different countries. And in total, those herbaria hold uh, more than 400 million plant specimens. So um, they're definitely worldwide. Um, there are tons of plants that exist in these um, museums. Here at the Cal Academy, uh, we are the sixth largest herbarium in North America and the largest one west of the Rockies. So uh, our collection houses around 2.3 million herbarium specimens, which is a lot <laughs> of specimens. Um, so, so that's kind of in a very big nutshell what a herbarium is. And now I want to spend some time talking about what herbarium specimens are and, and why they matter. So I'm going to walk through the different sort of pieces of a herbarium specimen, and I'm going to use this same uh, image of one of our specimens. Um, this particular one is near and dear to my heart. So, so this is a, a specimen of a plant called Castilea pilosa. Um, and this is one of the groups of Castilea that I worked on during my PhD. So I'm familiar with this um, particular specimen. So, you know, there are, there are various kind of components of a specimen that make it very valuable and that um, are basically the the bits of scientific knowledge that are stored in the herbarium. So the first element of that is the plant itself. So if we were looking at this specimen, um, you know, in person, um, one of the first things that a botanist will do is start looking at the plant. So um, here I've got some high resolution um, close up images of different parts of the plant. Um, you know, these uh, specimens are um, preserved in a way where we can um, still take measurements and observe various characteristics about the plant. 
So um, here in the bottom uh, right, I didn't mean to advance that just yet. Um, if you squint a little bit, you can probably see some of the hairs that are on um, the, the flowers and the bracts uh, in this, on this particular individual. Um, and, you know, uh, we can uh, actually put water on these specimens and, and um, dissect the flowers off and uh, take them off the specimen and put them in a separate location and um, continue to hydrate those flowers. And, and then you can dissect the flower as you normally would uh, during the regular identification process. Um, so, you know, these, these plants in and of themselves are sort of um, a physical example uh, of the plant. Also on the specimen is what we call a fragment packet. So on the main specimen there on the left side of the screen, on the bottom left is this fragment packet. And then I just put a zoomed up version of it um, uh, in the top part of the slide. These fragment packets hold fragments of the plants. Um, you know, when we do floral dissections, like I just mentioned, uh, we'll put these pieces of the flowers into the fragment pack so that, um, you know, we can, we can keep all of the little bits and pieces of the tissue together with the plant. And who knows, you know, in, in a couple of years, somebody might come along and want to look at those same um, dissected floral parts. And so the flowers are already there in the fragment packet uh, ready to be seen. Um, another sort of along the same lines of, of being able to study what the plant looks like. Um, when we take pictures of the plant, we also include um, this color bar and a ruler on the side. Um, and that's, this is just sort of to point out that we can, we can get elements of size from these specimens as well as color, especially when we're looking at digital versions of them. So the plant itself is, is probably the most important part of the herbarium specimen. Um, but the second most important part of the herbarium specimen is the collection label. And um, this is the sort of um, information that is provided by the collector that gives us uh, even more information about the, the specimen itself. So, this particular one uh, is a is a very brief uh, label, um, but it does have some of the most important elements of the label. So the identification of the plant. So um, this one was collected, um, and when it was collected, it was called Castilea pilosa. You can see that at the top of the label. And this individual was collected at Star Lake Trail in the Lake Tahoe region, and it was collected by M. S. Jusel. Uh, July 12th of 1928. So um, we know that the identification is Castilea pilosa. We know geographically where it was collected. Um, we know who collected it and when it was collected. And, and these are, quite frankly, the most important pieces of information that a collection label will hold. Um, sometimes collectors are, are much more verbose. <laughs> They'll talk about um, the colors of the plants, the smell of the plant. Oftentimes they describe the habitat, um, associated species, all of which serves to tell us what, um, you know, what the habitat looked like and, and um, more information about the plant that might be lost when we turn it into a specimen like this. Another really important element of herbarium specimens is um, what we call the annotation history of the plant. And this information is held with the annotation labels. So this particular specimen has three annotation labels. Um, the first one is, uh, in terms of dates, the first one is uh, one that Alice Eastwood put on this particular specimen. Um, she was a very famous uh, curator in our collection. Um, could give a whole other lecture about Alice Eastwood. She was quite an amazing botanist. Um, but she came along at some point and looked at this specimen uh, and, and disagreed with the identification of the plant. Uh, so M.S. Jusel had called it Castile Castilea pilosa. And, and she came in and said, no, actually, I think it's something else. Now, this particular, so 
so she applied an annotation label that would update the identification or annotate the identification of this particular specimen. Now, if you look closely at this label, it looks like she's written the word lupinus. Um, and it's really kind of funny because this is not a lupin. Um, my guess is, is that she knew very well that this wasn't a lupin, uh, but she perhaps her mind was in a different place and she ended up calling it lupinus gisellii instead of castilea gisellii. So, um, you know, she determined that this was no longer castilea pilosa or that this particular individual was not castilea pilosa. And in fact, she thought that it was a brand new species. And so she named it Castilea gisellii, and you can see that she designated this as a what we call a type specimen. So in the bottom right part of that uh, annotation level, you can see the word type. Um, and this is um, just indicating that it was one of her research specimens while she was naming this species. And I'm going to come back to this in just a second. Um, the next annotation uh, was made by N. Horseman in August of 1979. And, and here I think he was sort of updating um, the, the name and, and correcting Alice's error of Lupinus gisellii, and instead saying, no, this is Castilea gisellii. Uh, and you can see that it has uh, the authorship by Eastwood. So that was Alice. Um, and then the last annotation at the top of that specimen looks like this when we zoom into it. And this was a determination that was done by Noel Holmgren, uh, another famous botanist, uh, particularly in the Great Basin and the Intermountain West. Um, in March of 1980, he came and said um, that this particular specimen, Castilea gisellii, is actually a, a Castilea pilosa. So, um, with that equals Castilea pilosa bit along kind of in the center of that annotation label, he's basically synonymizing Castilea gisellii with Castilea pilosa. And he's saying, actually, this isn't a unique species. It's part of Castilea pilosa. Uh, and then there's a fourth annotation, which is written in, um, well, it's, it's a stamp and then some... Um, kind of handwritten bits. They're just to the right of that uh, Holmgren annotation. And this was made by Mark Egger in 1996. And he, right in front of his name, Mark Egger, there's an exclamation point. And that's the way that we say, I agree. And so uh, Mark Egger agrees with the annotation that Noel Holmgren uh, determined, um, indicating that Castilea gisellii is indeed uh, a synonym of Castilea pilosa. So, um, you know, sometimes these stories of annotation histories get very long and complicated, and sometimes it's hard to even know exactly what happened when. Um, but, but this history of annotation really sort of holds the history in our understanding of what this particular specimen is, and in this particular case, what a species is. So um, these are really valuable little pieces of information that are also stored on the herbarium specimen itself. So um, really quick, I wanted to show you um, the, the publication that uh, um, Alice Eastwood um, printed to publish Castilea gisellii. So you can see those lower two annotation labels both refer to the publication, the leaflets of Western botany. We can actually get online and, and find the excerpts from this particular publication to see that she indeed, she did indeed know that it was Castilea gisellii. You can see that in the top uh, box. Um, you know, as she was publishing this species, she has a Latin description of the species, followed by an English translation of that. That's the third box. And then the bottom box gives some uh, information about why she thinks that this was a unique species. Um, at the top of that lower box, you can see that the type is held at the herbarium of the California Academy of Sciences. And there it gives um, the accession number 165665 and information about where it was collected. Which leads me to the other sort of 
most important you know, element of a specimen. And these are the unique identifiers. So um, historically, we have used accession numbers. And nowadays, many herbaria are using barcodes. So we do have a barcode on this particular specimen, um, but the accession number, the stamp, the original stamp is, is on this specimen as well. And that's what was referenced in the original uh, publication. So, you know, these herbarium specimens do secure the plant. They have the plant there on the sheet, but there's a wealth of additional information held on that specimen um, in addition to the plant itself. So, um, you know, herbaria hold many, many, many of these herbarium specimens. So, so in our collection, uh, we store our herbarium specimens in folders, and these folders go in cabinets that look like this. Um, so you can see many of our different folders here. Um, we have many of these cabinets that we store on um, a special system of compactors that help us to, to move and store these cabinets efficiently. You can see the tracks of the compactors there in the, uh, the floor of the, the hallway there. And we have very large rooms that hold our compactors and our cabinets. So um, this is, I'm taking this picture from the end of one of our rooms, looking down the length of our collection. Um, and, and I think it does a good job of sort of indicating how big these rooms are uh, and how many cabinets we are, we have. But just in case you want some numbers, um, we have over 750 cabinets uh, stored in three separate rooms that together hold 2.3 million herbarium specimens, which is a lot of specimens, let me tell you. <laughs> Um, so I think, you know, one big question that might pop up in your head is like, why? <laughs> why do we have so many herbarium specimens? Why isn't just a single individual of every species enough? So, um, you know, one of the, the beautiful things of a, of a herbarium and particularly large herbaria, and even more so when we consider all herbaria together, is that they give us temporal resolution and geographic breadth when we look at the data that is stored within them. So when we look across all of the herbarium specimens that um, are held within these collections, we see this temporal resolution and geographic breadth. And I'm gonna kind of tease that apart a little bit. So from the perspective of temporal resolution, um, the big thing here is that plants have been collected um, through time. So if we think back to that herbarium specimen that I just walked us through, it was from the Lake Tahoe region, right? And that particular collection was made around 1928 or 1928. So we know from the timeline, from the beginning of our herbarium, which started in 1853, uh, to the present day, we know that this specimen, this individual existed in the Lake Tahoe region in 1928. Now, if we look elsewhere in our herbarium and look at the other Castilea pyloses, we'll find that, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the other Castilea pyloses specifically at Lake Tahoe, we'll find that uh, it also existed there in 1879. Uh, we have other collections from 1899. 1902, 1906, 1907, 1909, etc. So as we look across our collection of the Castilea pylosas from Lake Tahoe, we see a, a, a sampling of them through time. And that's that temporal resolution that I'm talking about. Now, the other thing that it, it gives us is geographic breadth. So here in this example, what I've been talking about is Castilea pylosa from Lake Tahoe, but Castilea pylosa actually exists outside of Lake Tahoe as well. So it is found in the rest of North America. So when we look at collections across herbaria, we can begin to see this. So I'm gonna um, take us to a link really quick. 
Um, let me just pull this up here. So this link gets us to um, a website called GBIF, which stands for uh, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. I think I got that right. <laughs> and if we look for Castilea pilosa at on this website, we're able to um, actually see all of the herbarium records that have been um, uh, deposited for this particular species. So I'm going to zoom into this map here. And here, you know, we have the map of North America, and every single one of these yellow points on the map corresponds to herbarium specimens that have been collected in these localities. So this isn't just our collections, but collections from all herbaria who supply their information to GBIF. And so we can see that, yes, Castilea pilosa is found somewhere around the Lake Tahoe area, but it also exists all the way across the Sierra Nevada, up into Oregon and Washington and Idaho, and even east into Montana and Wyoming. Um, so, so this gives us that geographic breadth for where Castilea pilosa exists, um, which is really cool. <laughs> Um, but but the other nice thing about this website is that here, GBIF has found a way for us to visualize the temporal resolution and the geographic breadth at the same time. So I don't know if you've noticed yet, but there's a little slider down here at the bottom where we can change the dates that um, the, the map is displaying the collections. So if we move this slider down, to like 1900 and look, whoop, there we go. And look at how many collections existed from 1900, we see that there's really only a handful of specimens that were collected at that point in time. Now, if we increase our, our temporal resolution to 1930, we can see that our understanding of the geographic distribution of Castilea pilosa has increased significantly just in those, those you know, 40 years of collecting. So as we add years, we can see how our understanding of Castilea pilosa and where it occurs um, has really changed. And I, I just think this is such a cool way to um, be thinking about um, this data. So back up to 2022, and, and we see sort of our modern interpretation of, of the range of Castilea pilosa. So, um, you know, it's these two things together. Um, when we look across many specimens, when we get to start digging into really truly the wealth of data that's in a herbarium, when we can look at specimens and look at specimens of species both through time and across geographic space, we begin to be able to ask really, really awesome questions. For example, um, you know, do species live in the same place through time? You know, when I was showing you the GBIF map, we could have originally said that Castilea pilosa may have had a very restricted range. Probably it existed in its current range, but we just hadn't sampled it yet. Um, but we have seen evidence in uh, herbaria of ranges of species expanding and contracting through time. We've also seen the extinction of species um, where the only living records of these specimens um, actually, or these individuals, these species exist in herbaria. Another really interesting question is, do species look the same through time? Um, by looking at each of these specimens and, and examining the floral or the fruit features, the leaf features, we can ask how specimens or species do or do not change through time. Another thing is, um, do species bloom or fruit earlier or later? in time. Um, this has been a really interesting research question in the last several decades as we've begun to understand how climate change is really affecting biodiversity. Um, there's a really awesome phenology project um, uh, that's 
being sort of run out of uh, Cal Poly in um, San Luis Obispo. And um, they are using herbarium records to document the fact that some plants are blooming earlier uh, as a result or in kind of concert with climate change uh, and fruiting earlier. And that has a whole suite of, of implications for the biology, um, both of these species and also the communities that they live in. And the last really awesome question is, how do the genomes of these species change through time? So another really amazing element of these herbarium specimens is that we can still extract DNA from the leaf tissue of these, not all specimens, but of many of the specimens. So we can begin to peek into their genomes and compare those through time. So, um, you know, I, I, I hope in this whole 25 minutes of talking that I've, I've sort of impressed upon you, um, you know, the breadth of our collections, but also the importance of, of these specimens, um, both, you know, to the, the scientific community, but also to anybody who's interested in, in plants and, and biodiversity more, more generally. So one thing I, I think becomes very apparent is that um, we really only have access to this wealth of information when our specimens are digitized. Um, you know, these days, uh, or before we started digitizing specimens, in order to visit a herbarium, you had to, um, you know, sort of be affiliated with a, a different herbarium. You needed to be able to travel to the herbarium and stay there while you're looking uh, at the specimens. Um, we do have, you know, loan programs, but uh, we only loan our specimens to institutions that can care for them effectively. So they're, you know, being affiliated with an institution is essential. Um, so visiting the collections and working with the specimens and, uh, you know, requires that you're there and present. But also in order to, to sort of in a very big way, um, organize and, and sort and query and visualize the data, it has to be stored in a computer so that we can summarize all of that data, um, you know, automatically. Uh, otherwise, it would take a lot of time to, to go through and record these things by hand. So um, we need to, you know, when a collection is trying to digitize its specimens, they are focused on transcribing the label data. So putting all of that label data into a, an electronic form, um, what we call georeferencing those labels. And so taking a locality and turning it into a latitude and a longitude so that we can place a pin on a map where that specimen came from. And then finally, taking a high resolution image of the specimen, which allows us to um, you know, zoom in and out on the specimen to measure things about the specimen, to sample colors from the specimen, et cetera. So when we've done this process um, in our herbarium, and, and many herbaria have done it this way too, and continue to do it this way, we, we sort of approach this as a one specimen at a time kind of process. So you know, um, a herbarium specimen is taken out of our uh, collection. Um, you know, a volunteer takes it to a, a data entry station and, and literally opens up a form and, and types the label data into the form. And, and this can take quite a long time. Um, so at our herbarium, we rely solely on volunteers, not solely, mostly on volunteers to do a lot of this type of work. And, um, you know, at any given time, we might have, um, you know, 30 volunteers, but uh, basically every day, there's usually like four or five of, of them that, that join us and, and help us to do our databasing. So if we think about like every day for about three hours, if we get five volunteers for three hours out of their day to database specimens at a rate of 10 specimens per hour, we can database around 150 specimens per week with those volunteers. Now, if you think back to how many specimens we have, 
uh, in our herbarium. That's 2.3 million specimens. And if we were going to try to database all of that, <laughs> it would take 294 years uh, for us to um, uh, database all of these specimens relying on five volunteers um, per week. So uh, quite a lot of time and requires a lot of um, effort from our volunteers. Uh, this, these days, um, we're going to take a slightly different approach to this um, um, process. And one of the, the big differences that we're going to do um, is uh, sort of taking advantage of the internet and um, crowdsourcing um, this transcription effort. So basically what I mean is um, providing images, putting images up on the internet, and then finding a way for um, individuals all over the world to look at those images and help us to transcribe them. So in order to do that, we of course have to take pictures of our specimens and then put those specimens online. Now, that's a pretty straightforward pipeline. Take pictures of your specimens, put them online, and people can help you transcribe them. Um, but it does, this does become a problem in and of itself because taking pictures of 2.3 million specimens is also very time consuming. <laughs> so, you know, the normal way that we have done this um, is by using a setup that looks something like this. So um, this is the same setup, but just from slightly different views. Um, that glowing box there in the center is a, a light box. It has two little doors that slide shut so that um, the light inside is, is beautifully illuminating a specimen. So you, you put the specimen in, you shut the door. Um, there's a little uh, clicker to, to take the photo. Um, there on the computer on the right, we um, do some slight uh, processing of the image and we save it, we rename it and save it and put it in a special place. Um, then you open the doors, you pull out the specimen, put it back on the cart that you can see there on the right. Um, and you put the next specimen in, you shut the doors, take the picture, process, rename, et cetera. So, you know, a lot of very repetitive tasks. Um, and, you know, it's it's a pretty efficient way. It takes beautiful pictures, this, this setup. Um, but it but it is kind of slow. Um, right now, we have one volunteer uh, who comes and works with us for about uh, five to eight hours a week. And um, he's our fastest imager. <laughs> uh, and he can do about 100 images per hour. And um, so that means that he's doing uh, about 500 images per week on average. So if we were gonna do 2.3 million specimens, uh, imaging them in this sort of normal way, um, this would take us 88 years, <laughs> which um, of course is uh, a long time too. So, um, you know, this is, you know, it is what it is, right? We have a ton of specimens and, and um, you know, this, this method of imaging is, is very high quality. It's what a lot of other collections do. But because our specimen, because our collection is so big, um, we really needed to start strategizing different ways to efficiently um, image our specimens. So our new way um, and our temporary new way um, is is to take quite a different approach. So now I'm gonna switch us over to um, some videos. So let me just pop this up here. So we are now the proud owners. Well, we're not an owner. We're a temporary residence <laughs> for um, a conveyor system. <laughs> we have contracted with a company called Pictura um, who uh, has conveyor belts um, that they use to image their specimens. Um, we took one of our offices in the botany department and modified it to hold this massive conveyor belt. Um, and I have a little video to show you um, what it looks like. And I don't think you're gonna hear anything, so I'm just gonna sort of talk as the video plays. 
So, um, you know, here I'm walking into the room and uh, walking down the length of the conveyor belt. Um, so specimens sort of enter the, the room uh, in this manner. They come in on these carts, like you can see here. And the first thing that happens is that they get unloaded. I'm just pausing the video for a second. So um, this is Maddie, one of our conveyor operators. She pulls the specimens from the cart there. Um, you can see those, those tags that are hanging down among the folders. Um, those are little tags that help us keep track of where, exactly where in our collection the, the folders came from. So she grabs the folders, she puts them on that table there, and she begins to unload them onto the conveyor belt. The conveyor belt moves sort of one segment at a time, and that movement is taking these specimens into what we call this big black box. Um, and here you can see uh, the black box. And if you look closely, there's a light that's flashing. Um, this is the light that illuminates the specimen uh, within that black box to take a, a really nice picture. There was the flash just then. So after these specimens have been imaged, they're picked up by Needy. This is our other uh, conveyor operator. And she's picking the specimens up in exactly the same order that they were unloaded. And then they go into a folder uh, and then they get put back on a cart and taken right back into the herbarium. Now I'm gonna stop the, the video again to show you um, this, this screen. So Needy, in addition to picking the specimens up and putting them back on the cart, she's also looking at this, um, the screen and watching as each of the specimens are automatically processed. So Pictura has software that um, as it's taking a picture of the specimen, it recognizes that barcode and it um, renames each of these images to be named as the barcode. It crops these images, it writes them, um, and basically makes sure that each of the, the, the the images are standardized and of the highest quality. Uh, this terminal also shows us, oops, sorry. Oh, dang, let me go back to the end. Um, this terminal also shows us uh, the number of specimens that were imaged. So when I took this video, they had done 2,555 images just in that day. And the rate uh, that they were going at just in that moment was 514 per hour. And um, they've gotten over 700 images per hour. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, different specimens and folders are easier and faster to image than others. So this, this rate does change. Um, one other video I want to show you. Um, is just a quick peek inside that black box uh, where the camera is held. It's kind of cool in there. So Needy is holding up the cover um, of that black box. So right here, we can see that the, you know, the specimens are coming into um, the, the black box. This white board back here, um, reflects the light that this uh, strobe light puts out. So the light flashes, it bounces off this white board and, and really nicely illuminates each of these specimens. Um, the camera is sitting up above, and I think I'm gonna pan up there with my video in just a second. So the, the camera is housed here on these um, wooden um, braces, and uh, all of which is suspended from this really large metal frame. And then as each specimen stops, um, right in front of the, the flashboard, you can just barely see it here. There's a, there's a color bar that has a ruler attached to it. And so this allows us to have that color bar and, and ruler in each of our images. That's it. So, um, okay, so now I'm gonna go back to the talk. Um, so this is our, our new but temporary way of doing things. And I sort of 
already gave you a um, an insight into um, how fast this imaging happens. Um, but with one conveyor belt running about seven hours per day at maybe an average of 640 images per hour, uh, five days a week, we're doing around 22,400 images per week, which means that we'll be done with all 2.3 million specimens in a little under two years. So uh, a massive change in efficiency for uh, imaging these specimens. So once we have these images, um, the idea is to take these images and uh, attach them to our internal databases. So for specimens that um, have previously been transcribed, so the label data has been entered into the database, these images will automatically attach to them and they'll become sort of a complete record. Um, for brand new, um, specimens. So specimens that we have no digital data for at all, um, these will create what we call skeletal records, um, which are basically kind of a placeholder in our database um, until we have that label transcription happening. Now that label transcription is another really important element of this project, because remember the label data holds the locality information, the associated species, the description of the habitat, it allows us to put a pin on a map where the collection was made. So that transcription is, is super important. So uh, you'll maybe recall from one of my earlier slides that we're going to use a crowdsourced, um, a crowdsourcing platform to um, take advantage of the internet and all of our volunteers and friends online uh, to help us do this, this process. So we're going to use a, a platform called Notes from Nature. And I have a quick link to their website too. So um, Notes from Nature is um, a platform that's hosted on the Zooniverse, uh, which is a big citizen science, community science um, kind of arena online. And um, Notes from Nature is a particular platform that allows us to transcribe museum records. So um, Lots of different natural history collections have used Notes from Nature to do just this. And um, I want to just show you really quick what this is going to look like. So um, these are just a few examples of, of Notes from Nature expeditions. That's what they call their projects. Um, and I wanted to put our attention uh, to the plants of Arkansas. This really warmed my heart when I saw this. I, I grew up in Arkansas. I um, uh, was just happy to see that that they're in the process of doing this with their specimens. But um, once you're within the Notes from Nature framework, uh, you can actually look at specimens. Um, so these would be the images. In our example, this would be the images that we're taking um, with Pictura. And then you can begin to add information from the label data. And so it uh, looks like they have, to begin with, they want us to record different elements of the location, the georeference coordinates if they're there, um, and the habitat and description. And as you sort of scroll through the different um, elements of this form, you're going to capture different pieces of the information um, that are on the label. So once that's done, then you can um, basically mark a specimen as finished, as, as fully transcribed. So this is the platform where we will be hosting our images and, and, and uh, really leaning on our volunteers and any people who want to help us to transcribe our labels. Um, so, you know, instead of having one person doing this, we can have many, many, many people doing this all at the same time. And then that information will travel back to us from Notes from Nature and go into our database. Um, these are, uh, uh, you know, crowdsourced projects, but uh, anybody can help. You can help anytime, anywhere, um, from any place. And um, if you all wanted to help, you you absolutely could. So um, after the label transcription happens, then the images and the label data will be transferred back to our database uh, to complete the digitization process. 
So, um, you know, we're just, so, you know, I've been talking a lot about the 2.3 million specimens that we have in our collection, um, which is true. Um, but this particular project with Pictura and Notes from Nature um, is really being sort of test driven uh, just on our California specimens. So these number, well, these number around like seven or 800,000, but we rounded up to a million. Um, uh, we actually don't know exactly how many California specimens we have. We might actually have a million. <laughs> We're gonna have to digitize them to find out. Um, it is gonna still take us some time, right? It's gonna take about two to three years, um, around a year or so to do the imaging and then um, two or so years uh, to do the digit, uh, the label transcription and the georeferencing. Um, and it does require a ton of help. So uh, we have staff in the herbarium that are dedicated uh, just to this project. So um, Sterling and Kieran here on the left are, are new hires for us uh, that are helping us to prepare the specimens. Um, Maddie is, is a conveyor operator. Um, she works for Pictura, but she's now officially part of, of our department's family. Um, and this is Emily, our collection manager. This has become one of her um, sort of main projects in the collection. And then we have two other fantastic curatorial assistants, uh, Rosalind and Ricardo, um, who are helping us as well. We have a, a, another hire, which um, will soon be joining us, um, and they will be um, focused on helping us move the data from all of these different places. So it's very much a, a big team effort uh, that will take some time, um, but uh, it'll be fun. <laughs> and, you know, I, I am always impressed with the size of this project, um, but always very grateful. Um, that we're getting to do this and, and then I'm getting to work with such a great team of people uh, to be to be doing this. So um, that's sort of the end of my talk today. Um, I do want to acknowledge uh, the funding for this project. Um, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation gave an incredibly uh, generous donation of money to help us uh, get this project off the ground. Um, we absolutely couldn't have done it without them, and um, um, you know they're they're really uh, making some. They've provided an opportunity that is going to make really massive changes for us and our our collection. So it's it's really amazing. Um, but this is only for our California specimens, so um, we're trying to spread the word uh, as much as possible that we still have 1.3 million specimens that need to be imaged and digitized um, and um, hopefully finding some funding to be able to do that. Um, I also want to acknowledge the Pictura and Notes from Nature, who are our close partners in this project. We certainly couldn't do it without them. Um, they've both been incredible um, groups of people to work with. Just lots of fun. Um, so I think with that, I'll stop blabbing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and uh, take any questions if anybody has any. Fantastic, Sarah. That's really very exciting. Thanks. I mean, kind of mind boggling, really. It is. Especially when you started out, kind of them doing it like one <laughs> 50 a day. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's pretty. Um, yeah, it's, it's, do you know, this is a kind of a weird analogy. So maybe it's not going to make sense. But, you know, whenever you fly, I'm always in economy, right? Like, those are the seats that I can afford, but I have gotten up to first class before I've been bumped up. And it's like, once you experience first class, it's sort of hard to go back to economy where it's like a lot tighter and you know <laughs> it's not as comfortable. You can't stretch your legs out and stuff. I mean, you still go back, obviously it's, it's great to be able to fly, but um, that's sort of how I feel about this digitization project. You know, it's like, we were, we were doing the standard, you know, one at a time, we're going to have this conveyor belt, but at some point it's going to leave <laughs> and, and we'll go back to the one at a time, but. Um. <laughs> well, maybe not. Who knows what might, who knows? Who knows? We do have a couple of questions. Though. Yeah, okay. some folks are, uh, got some good questions in here. Can I, uh, can I riff them off to you? 
Yeah, that sounds great. So, so Bob's asking, uh, thinking of uh, Alice Eastwood, are the cabinets fireproof? I know that they are. So <laughs> that is a great question. Yes. So I don't know if everybody who's watching knows um, we did lose um, almost our entire collection um, right after the earthquake. So the 1906 earthquake. Um, you know, the fires were were sort of heading towards the academy and Alice Eastwood went in there and rescued some of our specimens, uh, our type specimens specifically. And um, she managed to save, I think, like 15 or 1700 specimens, something like that. Um, she was wrapping them in her herbarium apron and lowering them over, you know, these crumbling banisters and the herbarium was up on the sixth floor and um but she only managed to save a few of them and, you know, before the fires were really pressing down on her. And so, you know, she left and uh, the rest of the collection burned. And um, yeah, so those those cabinets really are sort of one of the first lines of defense, uh, keeping our specimens safe. They they guard against they help guard against fire, <laughs> um, water and uh, insects and mold, things like that. Yeah, they're really an important part of keeping the collection safe. Yeah. And all the papers, acid proof, right? And all that. That's right. It's acid free paper. The the labels, um, whenever possible, are printed on cotton. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh Justin has a good question. Any uh, effort to combine herbarium data with data from something like iNaturalist? Is that oh that that's a great question. Yes, there are a lot of efforts to do that and many people that are actively doing it now. So um, when I showed you all the GBIF website, I had um, set it up beforehand to only show me herbarium specimens, but you can actually uh, toggle a switch that uh, shows you iNaturalist observations too. So that data is pushed to GBIF. GBIF aggregates the herbarium data as well as the iNaturalist data. Um, so, I mean, to Justin's point, like that, like massively, you know, adds to our understanding of the, you know, the geographic breadth and the temporal resolution of these collections, because these are, are really contemporary observations. They're like live, you know, in the moment. So yeah, it's a great question. And Jenny might have the best question of them all. How do I sign up to volunteer? Oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So we um, we haven't yet started our Notes from Nature project, um, but it should be live, I'm hopeful, in like two months. And so uh, we will definitely let as many people know as possible <laughs> when it does happen. Um, we'll have links on our website. Um, I'll share out uh, information about how to find the Notes from Nature projects, and um, we'll be tweeting about it. And Instagramming about it and TikToking about it and Facebooking about it. Like we'll we'll make sure that the the information gets out as as far and as wide as possible. So um I guess my my answer is stay tuned. <laughs> cool. Yeah. And um I was just curious, um are there uh protections of the digitized data to ensure the accuracy? Yes. Yeah. So, and that reminds me of another thing about the, the georeferencing. Um, so do you mean like accuracy for the label transcription? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the notes from nature platform, um, the way that most of these projects run, and, and this is how we will do it too, is that every single image actually gets transcribed by three different people. Mm -hmm. And then they have special uh, software that takes those three different things and compares them, and then it reconciles them. So, um, you know, if they match by at least 80%, then, you know, everything's good. Um, if they don't, then this, the transcriptions are flagged and, and they have to be looked at one at a time. Um, so that, that, that three independent things and then reconciling them is, is one of the first ways that we uh, try to keep the accuracy as high as possible. Mm -hmm. At the same time, our data coordinator, the last member of the team that is, is soon to be hired, 
um, that's going to be one of their biggest sort of responsibilities is quality assessment and control as data is coming to us and um, getting incorporated into our database. Um, you know, as is always the case when we're working with lots of specimens or lots of data, there's always going to be errors. So we, we sort of have to get comfortable with there being issues occasionally. You know, even with our sort of traditional way of doing this, where, where people were doing it one at a time, we still make errors, right? Like we transpose numbers and we misspell things. Um, so there will always be some inaccuracy, but, um, but we will be trying as hard as we can, of course, to, to have them accurate as possible. Um, your question also made me think of another really important thing for, um, you know, uh, people who care about the protection and the conservation of plants, particularly uh, rare or endemic species, um, you know, we have we do need to be careful about how we share the information where these specimens have been collected, and so um, we do have, uh, you know, kind of um, of a perfect word is escaping me here, but we've we basically put some um, security measures in such that things that are are threatened and are listed as threatened, um, that the, the geo-referenced locations and even the locality will be redacted from the specimen. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So that helps us to make sure that, you know, plants can't get poached, um, you know, now that our specimens are digitized. Yeah. Good, we're glad to hear that. Yeah. We yeah. know that with with birds, there's uh, sensitive information there. That yeah. So occasionally, is not redacted, and people <laughs> get worried about it. Yeah. And we read the feather thief. No. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you're familiar with that book about the person that went into the collection and stole all the feathers. No. <laughs> oh. Oh, that's awful. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Um, and you know, of course, that well, we we were discussing about AI possibilities and reading the labels and all that, and that there's a whole other can of worms that's interesting there. Yeah. So, so the notes from I I did kind of skip over this, but um, you know, as part of the the online transcription, we are going to uh, take advantage of. Um, a couple of different things. So OCR, like you mentioned, um, you know, that, that works really nicely on typed specimens. And so any of our images that have labels that are typed, um, we will run them through um, an OCR pipeline that tries to extract that information and put it into uh, the label fields uh, automatically. Um, a lot of our specimens, however, are older um, and were generated at a time when specimens were typically handwritten. And so um, the OCR approaches do tend to have a hard time with handwriting. Right. <laughs> and, um, and then we've got different languages on occasion, not right. necessarily with our California specimens, but um, those are some of the things that can trip up OCR. Right, right. So those will definitely be human entered. Another thing that we're doing, and, and this is really cool, um, you know, in order to get coordinates for the locations where these specimens were um, collected, uh, we're going to take advantage of all of the georeferencing that has happened in other collections that are already online. So when her when when botanists make uh, collections, they often collect enough material so they make several different specimens, and these are called duplicate specimens. And and usually you keep one at your institution and then you push the rest out to other herbaria to, right. to sort of share For the safety. wealth, you know. So if those other herbaria have already georeferenced your specimen, there's no need for you to do it too. Yeah, <laughs> and so nice. we'll actually take the locality data and blast it out against places like GBIF mm -hmm. to see if there are any other specimens that have the exact same locality and the exact same collector and collection number. Mm -hmm. And then we'll just take that, that georeference coordinate. Um, and that'll be a way that we can, and that we can be a bit more efficient about that approach. Yeah. Cool. 
as a as an amateur ecologist, I was excited about when you were talking about how some people would put like biological associate plants yep. and basically describe the habitat there. Yeah. And I was thinking, man, I wish more people would do that because then we could see change over time more yeah. clearly yeah. You know, shown. It's exactly uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, it, it is kind of funny, like even nowadays, I would say it's probably more common for that kind of information to be included on labels, but, but there is still a kind of a collector preference maybe, or, or. Um, a bias. I think it also matters like how much collecting a person is doing at any given time, you know, so sometimes right. these are, are massive trips with many different people and you're collecting everything that is at the appropriate stage to be collected. And so sometimes I think it can be really hard to keep track of that information as you're right. collecting and pressing and unloading and mounting specimens. Um, but for people like me who tend to collect what I'm specifically doing research on, um, I write much more extensive labels. I mean, my labels are like paragraphs sometimes. And, um, and, and so you still see a bit of a kind of a variation across different collectors, right? Um, but, but yeah, I the, guess by the virtue of labels, them, uh, having, a collection all at once of a whole bunch of different things just that tells a little bit of a story right yeah. there though huh? absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. cool yeah well hey this has been really exciting stuff good and, and i'll say uh our former president jerry said certainly one of the best chapter programs ever definitely the best presented program <laughs> Wow. So much, Dr. Jacobs. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. That's very kind. Oh, that makes me happy. <laughs> uh -huh. We appreciate your time. And, yes. Yeah. Anytime. Um, yeah, it was it was a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll, I'll let you all know when the notes from nature is is up and going. And um yeah, anytime you want an update, I could give like a little uh, you know. Yeah. Here's yeah, we'll done. definitely do that. And we can put it out on our, uh, you know, our communication, our communications with uh, yeah. our members. So great. That sounds good. Really appreciate you. We'll see you over at the Academy. <laughs> yes, that sounds good. All right. Thanks everybody for coming. We'll talk to y'all later. All right, everybody. See you next month.